Hello and welcome to the continuing series of the CSS Matrix, the Cascading Style Sheet document. My name is Sam Grant and this time we're going to continue this process by talking about the different CSS selector types. Now I know that a lot of you are confused as to how to interpret the CSS language at certain points, but we're going to show you how simple it is to identify the three basic types of selectors. That's right, I said three. There aren't 20, there aren't 30, there are not 100. There are only three different types of selectors. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about those three selector options and how they affect the individual aspects of the HTML document. Now the names of the three selectors are very, very easy to remember. And we're going to start by taking them one at a time. To begin with, let's identify them. The three common selectors in CSS are tag, class, and advanced. And each one of these has a certain effect on various aspects of the page, and then there are appropriate times to use each one depending on the effect that you want. These make the CSS perform duties that will affect the HTML document in ways that you never would in the basic document itself. So to begin, let's go ahead and start talking about the tag selectors. Now the tag selectors is exactly what it means. It affects the tags in the HTML document, which means basically you can use the tag selector to redefine the look of every instance of a specific tag or element. That means that every instance of a paragraph, every instance of a particular heading tag, every instance of an anchor, any one of the individual tags that exist in the HTML document will be affected by the changes in the tag selector. So this is very universal and all you have to do is to remember exactly what the tags are and how you want them to behave and you can write the CSS for it. Now the second type of selector is a little bit more complex but not confusing. This is called a class selector. Now the class selector really applies to anything on the page that includes its attributes in the XHTML document. And when it says anything, that means absolutely anything. You can take any phrase, any individual word, or even one individual character in a paragraph and you can affect it with a specific CSS class selector. Now, to, I, I guess the best way to explain this is to show you. Now, the XML document and the CSS document work in conjunction with one another, but you need to understand how they're affected in order to know what's really going on. Let's take a specific plain tag from the XML, like the paragraph tag, and what we're going to do is that we're going to apply a specific divider tag to it, which in this case is going to be a class tag. So the class selector we're going to apply to the XHTML would be written this way we're going to name it warning, just to indicate that we wanted to have like a little warning box on a specific element. And this means that we want to somehow place emphasis on something in the document, but not the entire block of paragraph, just only the areas surrounded by the class tag. So in the corresponding CSS, you'd be writing it out this way. You'd open up the existing tag by writing the word warning, and then, of course, the opening bracket, which begins the decoration block. Pay close attention to the dot at the very beginning of this. All class tags have a dot at the beginning. So whenever you're writing a class effect or a class selector in the CSS, always make sure that this dot exists at the beginning. Otherwise, it will not behave properly. Or worse, it won't even bother to do anything at all. Now to continue this, we'll simply write in the decoration, which is going to be the font weight and the color. Don't forget, once again, to write in the proper syntax, which is the colon and the semicolon, in order to break up these individual decorations. And then close it with the appropriate curly bracket. Once this is done, you now have the common effect between this. So now, that means that every instance where there is a surrounding class of warning, well, all of the information will be affected by this weight and this color. So to recap, what a class selector actually does, it literally always begins with a period. Definitely make sure you put the period in front of it whenever you're writing the CSS. Second, use a descriptive name referring to the purpose and not to the appearance of the tag. For example, if you wanted, like we did before, if you wanted to have an emphasis piece, which would be for warning, make sure you name it warning. Or if you want to name it pull quote, always use something that you can always get back to that refers to the purpose and not what it looks like. This will help you in the long run. And then third, you can use this as many times as you want within a single document. You can take a class selector and apply it to any individual word, any place on the document, and you can place this in there as much as you want. Be careful because you can get into a situation where you can put too many class selectors on there where it would be much more appropriate for you to write a much more sweeping tag. 
the class selectors can become very, very cumbersome, cumbersome and can literally wear down your document. So use these things sparingly. If you have to make sweeping changes over the entire document, it's better to use a larger, more advanced selector than the class. Which brings us to the third process, which is the advanced selectors. Now, the advanced selectors cover a much broader spectrum. In this case, it applies mostly to three different types of selectors. And each of these are going to be identified by their individual names. The first one is ID, the second one is pseudo, and the third one is descendant. We're going to take these one at a time so we can explain as to when the best time is to use each one. Starting with the ID selectors, which are also spelled out as identifiers, these pieces are often used to identify a specific area on the page, which is a section or a region of the document. For example, in the XHTML, you would use a div ID to identify a specific area of the web page. We'll start with something called sidebar. Sidebar is normally a common term associated with information that you want to appear in a side area or a column that sits off to the side of the main category. So here is how the actual tag would be written in the CSS. In the CSS, you would write the rule, and it would move the sidebar div 200 pixels from the left. Now, if that's what you wanted to do, you would have to write it this way. You would put in the symbol here, which is the numerical symbol, sidebar, then you put in the appropriate decoration block, which here is margin left, and then 225 pixels. This command will take the entire sidebar and give it a margin of 225 pixels from the left. Please make note of the symbol in the beginning, which looks like a pound sign, or some people call it a number sign, but the true term for this is an octothorpe. If you want to continue to call it the numerical sign, you can, but it's actually the octothorpe. This is the true identifier for all IDs. Make sure you include this one so that the CSS can distinguish it from all of the other types of selectors. Now, to move on to the next one that's called a pseudo selector. Now, pseudo selectors are basically used whenever you want to identify aspects of like a link. Let's say, for example, you wanted to identify where a certain behavior is going to occur. And the most common of these, of course, are the linking tags. So in the CSS, these would be affecting anchor or anchor tags, which is normally the A inside the brackets. The CSS for this would be affecting, first of all, here, the tag for the link itself. This one, which is the visited link, which lets you know that whenever you return to that particular page, there will be an indication from the CSS for a link that's already been visited. The most common one is this one, which is the hover tag, which is the same thing as a rollover. That means if you were to take the mouse and then place it over the top of the anchor in the actual XML document, this CSS will take over. It's the same thing as if you were putting in regular JavaScript, but in this case, it's being done in the CSS. And then this one, which is an active link, which actually could be used to identify the link that's currently in use, either a down state or the actual link that's being affected right now. There are other states in this one, including the focus state, but we'll cover those a little bit later. And now the more common one, which is probably the one that appears to be the most complex, but really is the easiest one to remember once you understand it, is the descendant selectors. Now the descendant selectors are basically more or less like used to target elements within a document tree. Now a document tree is not a complex thing. It's similar to basically a family tree with siblings and children. In many cases, you'll see people who will draw a box and then have varying boxes come off of it. Sometimes organizational charts are used to identify this but the more common word is a family tree. So with the document tree, it would basically show you a breakdown of how all of the individual target elements are connected within the document. This can be a very, very powerful targeting tool if you wanted to affect something very, very specific in the document, but you only wanted it to affect that area and not the same occurrence on the other places in the document. Now, this is a bit confusing. Let me go ahead and break this down to you. Let's start with a very, very simple organization chart, which in this case is called the document tree. Now, this document tree indicates a body tag itself. So you have to kind of like imagine each of these as an individual tag within the HTML document. Each one of these represents a various descender within the document, the container, the sidebar, the main content here, and other areas. You'll notice that the sidebar area and the main content area actually are split into different areas. You'll have to imagine right now that the sidebar is a narrow area sitting over to, let's say, either the left or the right of the area, which is the main content, which is probably a wider area containing the primary information. 
So if you want to make it simple on yourself, try to imagine the sidebar as a bar on the side of information, and then the main content area as a wider, more descriptive area. Now, to get these things to work, we'll simply start with a basic breakdown. If you wanted to affect, let's say, the H1 tags in this document, you would simply write an ID selector of H1 and then give it a declaration block. Here, I'm using the color red. If this were written, then every instance of the H1 tag in the entire document would be given the H1 color red. There's no way to actually separate these elements, no matter where you place it in the document, no matter how far down the document tree it would exist, all H1 tags would be immediately turned red. But what if you didn't want this? What if you wanted to have something that was a little bit more controlled? For example, what if you wanted to have a specific color of H1 tags in the sidebar and then have a different color in the main content? This would require you to write a little bit more sophisticated tag, which in this case is a descendant selector. To do this, you would write a specific tag that would affect only the sidebar content and then one that would affect the main content. And you would do this by writing in the information about the actual piece you want to affect, which in this case is the sidebar div tag, and then the descendant you want affected within it. So it would be written, of course, with the octothorpe, sidebar, h1, and then color red. Now to affect the information in the main content area, you would write the information, to, so main content, then h1, and then the color green. With these two separate descendant selectors written in the document, the appropriate color would be given to each one. The sidebar would get its red declaration, and the main content would get its green information. So that means that all of the H1 tags under the sidebar would be red, and all of the H1 tags under the main content area would be green. This works for every single tag selector in the entire document. No matter how far down or far up it is in the selection process, all you have to do is to write in the proper sequencing, and it will actually go down to the proper area. As confusing as this is, just watch this video as many times as you have to to get clear on it. But once you understand the different types of tag selectors there actually are, you'll be clear on how CSS really works. Thanks for listening. This has been Sam Grant.